participants are in a listen-only mode. During the question and answer session, press star 1. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I'd like to turn the meeting over to Jared Liu. Thank you. You may begin. Great. Thanks, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. This is the Thursday webcast series. <clears throat> it's a bi-monthly webcast held at the lunch hour. The trainings leverage local successes by amplifying to a larger audience to model organizations, methods, materials, and approaches. Sessions are planned to last no more than one hour, with two presenters speaking on the same topic from slightly different perspectives, each for 10 to 15 minutes, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers. Today's session is approved by the ISA for one CEU hour and by SAF for one CFE Category 1. If you haven't already given me your certification number, you can email me after this session. Uh, also, most state landscape architecture boards require only a certificate of completion, which uh, we're happy to provide to members who request this. This is a program of the Alliance for Community Trees, and we can, uh, encourage you to consider joining if you're not a member. We want to thank the sponsors on today's call, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service. Today's session is Trees at Play Spaces. Trees and landscaping are sometimes considered extras when it comes to play spaces, and can be the first on the budget chopping block, but they're an integral element of healthy play and learning environment for children. Incorporating trees at play spaces improves the aesthetics, provides shade to reduce children's exposure to UV rays, and cleans the air to help prevent asthma and promote healthy lung function. By introducing into the play environment, trees also spark children's imagination and creativity. It's time to reconsider landscaping extras as, and begin to see trees as critical components of successful play spaces. Today's first speaker is Dave Flanagan. He is the Director of Operations at Kaboom. His interest in outdoor play began with hiking and camping in the Adirondack Mountains as a child, and his love of nature and the outdoors led him to pursue a degree in environmental studies at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. He has worked as an environmental educator at the Living Classrooms Foundation in Baltimore, as a program manager at the National Tree Trust, and oversaw the community gardening program for the city of New York. He currently lives in Silver Spring, Maryland with his wife and children, and we're happy to have Dave with us. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jared. Um, really excited to talk about this topic. Um, I'm going to kind of walk you through um, sort of the sort of big picture, uh, talk a little bit about Kaboom and the work that we do, and, and how you can be thinking about incorporating trees and nature into play spaces in the work that you're doing. Um, so I'll, I'll be talking about um, the work of Kaboom, and then I'll be turning it over to Kathleen, and um, Jared will talk, uh, will introduce Kathleen uh, when I've completed this, um, this presentation. So uh, the first thing that I wanted to just kind of uh, touch on is what we're going to be talking about in the presentation today. Uh, we're going to highlight how you can work with local partners and Kaboom resources to bring a playground to your neighborhood. We're going to talk about incorporating landscaping and trees into the playground construction plans, talking about educating um, project funders about the importance of trees in play spaces, uh, greening existing playgrounds in your neighborhood, uh, highlight a little bit of children's activities and educational play involving trees and nature, and then the case study will be the SPARK program that Kathleen will be talking about. So to kind of get started, um, to give you a little bit of background on Kaboom, Kaboom is a national nonprofit that envisions a great place to play within walking distance of every child in America. And we, accomplish, uh, we work to accomplish our vision through a variety of different programs. Uh, we have a program where we are working with communities and funding partners mm -hmm. to come together uh, around an eight-week planning uh, period of time where we bring the community and the funding partner volunteers together to plan and implement uh, a playground project in one day. So through those efforts, we're able to, to create about 200 playgrounds a year. But we, know, we realize that that 200 is not going to get us to our vision of a great place to play for every child. So we have really focused a lot of our efforts on uh, our online resources and tools so that organizations who are wanting to do a playground project in their community can go to, onto our website and go through a step-by-step -step process of how to go about doing that. So we're really trying to encourage communities to do it on their own, and we have a lot of great resources and tools for folks to do that. In addition, we're also uh, recognizing cities 
around the country for their efforts around play. And to that end, we've created a Playful City USA program modeled after the Tree City USA program. And essentially, it's a recognition of cities that are, are see that play is not just a privilege but a right and something that should be incorporated into all the uh, planning and budgeting for the city. And then um, the other big sort of area that, of our focus is that we see that play is on the decline. Um, recess is being taken away from school, school days, and um, budgets are being cut. So we really want to make sure that people are advocating for the right to play in their communities. So with that, um, I just wanted to show you, uh, this, this is a screenshot of our website. I definitely encourage everyone to go to kaboom.org to learn more about our resources and how you can get involved um, in our, uh, our projects or how you can work with communities that you may be working with to bring a playground to their community. So um, that's a little bit about the boom. And taking a step back, one of the things that we realize is that play comes in many forms. It can come as a post and, plat post and platform playground that you may think of traditionally. But we also recognize that nature is a critical element to a child's development and an important part of uh, a children's play experience. And we're starting to see, unfortunately, kids are not going outside as much. They're not being exposed to nature. And even with Richard Liu's book, uh, Last Child in the Woods, it recognizes that, you know, kids are being exposed to TV, video games, and really are not um, outside and, and playing and, and being creative and exploring. Um, this quote is pretty daunting when the, a fourth grade child in San Diego says, I would like to play indoors better because that's where the, all, all the electrical outlets are. And it's a real shame that that's the kind of thinking that a lot of kids have these days. So how can we make sure that we're creating play spaces and environments that kids are going to want to go outside and really take advantage of their, the natural um, world in which we live in? There's a tremendous amount of um, research and statistics that are out there, and I'm not going to read through all these, but just to point out that a lot of um, observations and, and uh, scientific research has been done to show why nature is important. So kids who are playing outside are smarter and can do better in school. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with Dr. Quo's work. Um, and so there's just a lot of things to show that the, the benefits of having nature in the play experience. Um, we also know that kids who play outside are happier and get along better with others. Um, reducing stress um, with teens, you know, they're, they're able to have better self-esteem, self-confidence, independence. Um, all those are a direct result of having that experience of being in nature. Um, and then the recess opportunities are really important. I, my wife's a teacher, and she says every time the kids are outside and blowing off steam and they come back, they're more focused and they're ready to get back to work. Um, so a lot of, like I said, a lot of great research. And as you're talking to funders about why putting trees and nature into play spaces is important, I would definitely go back and cite those resources. And, you know, I'm sure you do a Google search and you can find a tremendous amount of, of things to, to really show that, that uh, trees and nature are important. Some other things that, um, that Jerry kind of talked about in his introduction is trees really are providing um, some other benefits that uh, are really important, in particular in play spaces. We all know in the heat of the summer, um, sometimes the, 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 the sun beating down on the slides and the swings of a playground make it so hot that the kids aren't even able to play on it. So providing some kind of shade is critically important so that we can make sure that those playgrounds can be utilized. And as we all know, trees are one of the great benefits that they provide is providing shade. So, um, again, that's something that, uh, you know, either through existing trees that are on site or trees that are planted can provide the great shade that is needed to cool down the playground. In addition to the shade, um, there's also the environmental benefit aspect of incorporating trees and nature into your play spaces. Um, some things that we've been working on is to try to incorporate um, existing trees into the overall play space so that it provides the shade, but it also provides that um, mitigating the heat island effect, um, retaining stormwater on site, um, making sure that uh, there's a fun sort of environment uh, for the kids to be playing in. So all those coupled together um, are really some important things for, for why trees uh, should be part of the, of the play space landscape. 
Also, um, we always talk about sort of the hardscape and um, of, of cities and urban areas and putting trees and community gardens and benches and planters in areas where there might be just asphalt really does soften that landscape. And again, it, it really does have an impact on kids' learning and in kids' enjoyment of that play space. And it also does reduce the amount of heat that uh, is beating down um, on asphalt or concrete. Uh, we've done several projects where we've worked with a community or a school where they've taken out asphalt or concrete and took that all away, put in grass or put in flowers and plants and trees, and it really made a huge difference um, in the kids' uh, experience and learning. So now I want to talk a little bit about um, incorporating landscaping and trees into playground construction plans. Whenever we're doing any kind of uh, playground project, it's really important to kind of take a step back and look at the, the overall area in which you're going to be working in. Um, you want to be able to create a sort of a master plan, thinking about where the playground is going to be and where you're going to be incorporating peripheral um, items such as benches and picnic tables and things like that. But of course, um, also thinking about the trees that you're going to be planting into your area. So to that end, there's some, some important considerations that you want to look at when you're creating your master plan. So when you're looking at your site as a whole, um, you want to take an assessment of the existing trees, because hopefully where you're building, there, there is some existing trees that you can build um, in and around. But as we, as, as it's very important to ensure that you're looking at the location of those trees and thinking about where the root systems are going to be running. So if you're looking at your tree, you look at where the drip line is of the trees, you can get a sense of where those root systems are going. Um, so you want to locate your uh, playground in an area that's going to have the least amount of root, root uh, disruption. Um, because as we all know, as soon as you start killing off a lot of the, the lateral roots, um, it can damage the tree and um, definitely take the lifespan of the tree down. So we want to make sure that we're looking at that. Also, you want to be looking at the height of the branches. Um, per the safety guidelines that are established for playground safety, um, there cannot be any branches or any overhead obstructions um, that are less than seven feet above the highest point of the playground. So thinking about that in relationship to the playground design, so if you have a high part of the playground that's going to be in an area where there's a lot of low-hanging branches, that may not be the best way to, to position your playground. Um, and if it's such a case that the, there's a lot of low-laying branches, um, you might have to think about pruning those um, depending on the situation. And then all playgrounds require a use zone, and essentially a use zone is the area that there's nothing there um, between the actual playground and, um, say, a tree or a bench or something like that. It's, it's meant to be a, sort of a safe area, so if a kid were to fall off the playground, they're going to fall onto the safety surfacing and not into a tree or a bench or something like that. So again, thinking about the trees in relationship to where the playground is going to be located. So that's kind of related to the existing trees that uh, might be on the site. Um, with new tree planting, again, you want to figure out where your playground is going to go and then figuring out where the, the, uh, the actual trees will be in relationship to that playground. Again, thinking about all the other things that we just talked about, so the height of what the branches are going to be, um, the use zone of the playground. Now, typically, when you're planting new trees, you're not going to be planting the, a mature tree, but maybe you'll have, you know, an inch to two inch caliper tree. Um, but again, thinking ahead, where are the branches going to be when this tree does mature? Where is the root system going to be? Um, all those things are important because you want to make sure that, you know, 25, 30 years later, um, when this, this tree has matured, it's not going to have an impact on the playground. Um, also be considerate of the uh, being uh, a native tree. Um, also making sure that you're looking at what are the, the types of things that might drop off of that tree. So it's not probably a good idea to put a sweet gum tree in a playground because of the, the spiky um, seed pod that it drops um, because you don't want that in the playground and, and creating a safety hazard. Or any kind of uh, pollen, high pollen trees, um, be considerate of, of that uh, as well. And then, of course, it's very, very important to ensure that when you're planting these trees with communities that you might be working with is to make sure there's a maintenance plan, uh, making sure that the trees are going to be watered um, over time, um, that they're pruned properly, and uh, there are not any hazards. Um, so making sure that those, those, things are, those plans are put into place 
ahead of time before um, starting your project. Some other fun things that you can think about with trees, you may not be having to do shade trees um, if there's not enough room for it, but you may be able to do some things like a willow hut. Um, this is a, this picture you see uh, is a willow hut that was created in a community uh, playground area, and essentially they took the willow trees, planted them in such a way that they were able to grow and create a fun um, entrance to the overall playground. There's a lot of cool things that trees can you can be doing um, other than just what we talked about a little bit ago. Some additional things that you can consider in addition to trees are some other natural elements that make the, the, the play space a uh, fun experience. Here's some examples of projects that we've done. We've done a pizza garden. Uh, we were essentially we were planting uh, some herbs and tomatoes and things like that, all the elements of a, of a pizza. Uh, we did a butterfly garden. Uh, we've done community gardens. So those are other elements that can be added into the overall play space. And then um, some other relevant examples of things that we've done. Um, we've actually uh, did a project, um, and I'll talk about it in a second here, but we were looking at how can we utilize the natural environment as the playground itself. So we've done things such as embedding slides into the hill. Um, we've done uh, stumps. Uh, that we created sort of a jumping course um, in an area, and there really wasn't a lot of uh, post and platform or practically nothing uh, was really using the, the natural environment uh, to create the actual uh, play space itself. So one of the things that we did was a project in Hawaii uh, last year where we looked at the existing landscape um, we incorporated lots of different elements, um, and in this design it's kind of hard to see, but there, were an area, there was an area that was an insect garden. There was an area that had a, a labyrinth that was made out of uh, plants. There was a uh, fort that was created. Um, and then there was just a lot of different native trees that were planted throughout the whole area. And again, those, this is something that's going to grow over time um, and be, be something that kids are going to want to come back to, have a different experience every time. Um, and I think that's, that a lot can be said about you know, these design elements in the t traditional playground structure that you may be familiar with. You know, it's, it's great to have that, the, the post and platform structure, but what other elements can be added? So the trees we talked about, um, maybe even doing like a scavenger hunt, um, so finding, you know, leaf shapes um, of the various trees or plants that are in that environment. So it really kind of gets kids excited about coming back to that spot um, time and time again and staying longer. Um, because it's important to make sure that we have an environment which kids are going to want to come back to um, and, and really have a different experience every time they come out. Um, and then here's some of the other examples of uh, play spaces that have been created. These are not ones that Kaboom has done, but they're representative examples of how the natural environment can be the play ground, if you will, uh, for kids in those communities. And the other thing I just wanted to mention is that there, is a, there are a tremendous amount of resources as well uh, with regards to incorporating nature and trees into the landscape, into the play space. So here you'll see the Natural Learning Initiative, the Natural Playground Company and Planet Earth Playscapes, the National Arbor Day Foundation, um, the National Forum on Children and Nature. So th these are just some really quick examples of places you can go to to learn more about nature, tree planting um, in play spaces. Uh, and things like that. So that is sort of, a, in a nutshell, um, incorporating trees in the play spaces. I think the big take-home take, take take away message uh, that I wanted to impart to all of you is that, you know, trees and plants and other natural elements really do a lot to enhance the overall play experience. And Kaboom is really committed uh, a lot of effort to figuring out w how we can incorporate those things into the, the, the play spaces that we're creating with communities. And really think about, you know, with the community, what do they want to see um, creating sort of uh, charrettes and having sort of where the playground is going to go and then how we can add trees as part of that overall play space. So that's um, uh, my uh, presentation. Um, and I guess at this point I would turn it over to Jared if, if there are questions. Great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Carly, can you open the lines for questions, please? Yes, thank you. To ask a question, press star 1 and record your name clearly and loudly. 
Your name is required to introduce your question. Once again, that's star one, and it is star two to withdraw your request. So let's do one moment for the first question. Great. And anyone who wants to type their question in can use the Q&A tab at the top of their screen. Uh, I will come on the line and read your question for you um, if you're feeling bashful or just inclined to type. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to start with, Dave, is um, how we, uh, from, from the perspective of tree organizations, what can we do to make sure that you know, trees are being incorporated into play spaces? You know, like I, I think you mentioned some great things like <clears throat> making sure that you know, we're thinking about the, the, you know, the seven-foot overhang and such uh, you know, so that you know, we, can, we can cite those spaces. But are there things that we, can ha that we can do to make sure that play space builders are incorporating trees and landscaping at the early stages in the design aspects? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, Kaboom is trying to, to do is to really um, get communities that we're working with to identify local resources, such as, as an ACT member, um, into to the design process. And what, the way in which we work is we do a design day where the kids are designing their dream playground, and we also work with the adults to identify what are some of the side projects, benches, picnic tables, and trees, and things like that how those will be incorporated. And having an ACT member or some other environmental organization coming to that design day to talk about um, why uh, trees are important, as well as helping to identify right tree and, and the right place uh, to put that into the, to the play space. Great. Yeah, and of course, we've been working together, too, which I'll highlight for everyone on the phone, too, that you know, we exchange contacts with Kaboom so that uh, we know when Play spaces are coming up, and they know who uh, who we who we know in that area, and that we can help connect those two. Um, we have a question here: Is there a higher liability due to the non-safety tested character of natural play structures? That's a really good question. Um, that you know, with the uh, traditional posting platform, the the American Society of Testing Materials and the Consumer Product Safety Commissions has very um, specific guidelines, uh, requirements for safety, for playgrounds and safety surfacing. With natural playgrounds, it's a little bit of a, a grayer area, um, and I, I don't know specifically in terms of the liability. I know that one of the things that we did in, when we were doing the Hawaii project is we tried to look at what are the safety guidelines for playgrounds and try to adapt them for the natural playground area that we created. So making sure that there's nothing that is going to cause um, a head entrapment or pinching or um, or if, if you had an area for a jumping course, making sure that as the kids were jumping, there was a, a safety surfacing around that in case they were to fall. Um, so we really try to take those into consideration. It's a good question, um, and I think, you know, that the, there definitely, I think, is a, things being looked at in rela relationship to nature playgrounds and elements that are there to ensure that it is uh, safe. But as it, as it exists now, there's nothing that's in the books. Um, I suspect there might be in the future, but um, not at this time. Great. Thanks. Uh, I've got a question for you about, uh, I guess, how you work with the funders or the community members who are advocating for elements of play areas that can provide shade for kids now uh, versus the benefits of trees in the future for providing shade? It, it, that's a good question. Um, you know, obviously when you're planting a, a, a smaller tree, it's not going to provide that, that shade benefit. Um, so I think one of the things we try to do is, in addition to um, the, the, the design day that we have, we try to we encourage uh, communities and schools to do service learning activities. So in the schools, they're talking about, you know, for example, why trees are important, um, so that the kids can say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm involved in this project. Um, maybe one of the things that we'll do is do the tree planting, um, and knowing the benefits of the trees um, may not be the shade at that moment, but knowing that there's going to be the whole notion of carbon sequestration or reducing um, stormwater runoff, you know, those kinds of benefits are more immediate, um, so the kids can see that the trees that they're planting have the immediate benefit, but also the long-term benefits of the trees being planted. Does okay. that answer your question? Does the operator have any questions in queue? I do not show any questions on the phone. Okay. Uh, Dave, I, I know a lot of times 
you know, play spaces are built when the weather is warm, um, which uh, goes against uh, in many places when trees are planted, when it's, you know, just starting to cool off or when it's just starting to warm up. Um, but, you know, thinking about, you know, what, what events or times of year are, uh, you know, are people thinking about play spaces or child's health that you, you think there might be a, a natural fit for us to push together? You know, like, do you, do you work on, like, National Childhood Obesity Month or something like that when it might make sense for play space builders and tree planters to push on the issue together? Well, that's a really good question, Jared, and I think um, one of the things that I, I, we're, we're cognizant of is making sure that we're planting trees at a time when it's the most appropriate, so spring and fall time um, when the trees are, are in more sort of a dormant um, state. So, you know, we don't, we, we don't have anything specifically around big events. Um, you know, I think it's a great uh, topic for conversations. Uh, perhaps we look at the projects that we're doing to tie into uh, Arbor Day or Earth Day. Um, it really depends on when we're doing the projects. I mean, we tend to do a lot of our projects actually in the fall. Um, so September, October are really one of our, or two of our busiest months. So, you know, th with the projects that are coming up, uh, I would love to explore how we can, you know, get the word out to ACT members and other environmental organizations about the work that we're doing and to try to connect folks together to say, hey, here's a great opportunity uh, to incorporate these trees into um, those play spaces. Now, for projects that we're doing in the summertime when tree planting is not ideal, one of the things we've been talking about is still identifying a local tree planting organization, ACT member, and starting the process then, but, but then coming back in the fall when it's the appropriate time and actually do the tree planting. We did a project in Portland, uh, Oregon, and it was in the summertime, but it wasn't the right time to plant trees. And we worked with Friends of Trees um, to connect them with this group, and then the Friends of Trees actually came back in the fall and helped to do some tree planting uh, in and around the play space. Great. Um, and and we'll, uh, we'll make sure that we're coordinating, at least from our perspective, with you on Neighborhoods Month again this year, which is the month of October. Great. We've heard a lot of great stuff about uh, sort of how to work with partners when planning new play spaces. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about uh, how people who have existing play spaces in their communities that are devoid of green elements could work with local partners to try to introduce some trees or other green elements into a, an existing play space. Well, there's a couple. Um, uh, that's a really good question, and I didn't hit, the, hit on that very hard, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of play spaces that are already there, uh, may not have any green space at all. So one of the things that I would encourage everyone to do is to go to the Kaboom website, and we have something called the Play Space Finder, and it's a really great tool. You can um, put in your zip code, and it will show up all the play spaces that are in, in your zip code, um, and that would be a great way to kind of see the, the playgrounds that are in your area. And with the pictures, you may have a good sense of, hey, you know, I don't see any trees or any other kind of green elements. This might be a opportunity for me as a member of a tree planting organization to reach out to that group and see if there couldn't be a way to incorporate um, some trees uh, or green space into that uh, environment. Um, you can leave a comment uh, for that play space, or uh, if you wanted to, uh, contact Kaboom and we could figure out, you know, where that playground is and who might a contact be so you could reach out to them. Um, and again, I think with Jared um, talking about how we can connect folks together, um, looking at past projects or even projects that we weren't even involved in, um, is to try to make those connections between the ACT members and those organizations to kind of really have the conversation about putting trees and green into those uh, areas. Thanks, Dave. All right, Carly, do you have any questions in queue? I do not. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll hold off on uh, any further then with, uh, with Dave, and we'll go on to Kathleen. But uh, if there are other questions for Dave, we can certainly get them at the end of the presentation as well. So our second presenter today is Kathleen Owenby. She's the Executive Director of the Spark School Park Program in Houston, where she has worked with corporate and community leaders since 1988 to raise more than $14 million for the renovation of Houston area school parks. There are currently 180 SPARC sites in eight Houston-Harris County area school districts. 
Kathleen is on the advisory board of the Park People, Urban Harvest, and Trees for Houston. She serves on the governing board of Earth Share of Texas, is treasurer of Houston Area Urban Forestry Council, a member of the Texas State Urban Forestry Council, and a past board member of Women Professionals in Government. Kathleen is a 1993 graduate of Leadership Houston and has received certifica uh, certification as a playground safety inspector. She earned a bachelor's degree in arts and sciences from the University of Houston, and we're happy to have Kathleen with us. Well, I'm happy to be here, and um, greetings to everyone from Houston. Um, as Jared said, Spark is a nonprofit um, based in Houston, and um, we work with schools to help them develop their playgrounds into community parks. And one of the things I think that we do best is actually um, going into schools and empowering their um, their community and their what we call a spark committee to actually make changes and improvements um, to what becomes a community park on the school grounds. And um, so that's our mission. Um, and actually the history of the SPARK program goes back to 1983 when there was a green ribbon study that was commissioned by then um, Mayor, Houston City Mayor McCann and the county judge on how to increase park space in the city of Houston. And at that time, Houston was 146th in the nation as far as park space um, per person. And so there definitely needed to be something done um, to um, increase park space in Houston. Um, what happened was that there was this green ribbon study done, um, and there was a city council member who gave the report, which was 12 or 13 pages, to a summer intern who she told to highlight different things for her that he thought was important. So one of the things that was highlighted was the Senate's make use of public school grounds. And um, she had um, been on the school board of Houston ISD for four years, and so she sort of knew the players at the major school district in the city of Houston. And so she brought those people on board um, in what became an interlocal agreement between the city of Houston, the school district, and then Spark, the nonprofit, um, to create these um, Spark parks, um, school parks on school grounds, community parks on school grounds. Um, in 1991, we got our own 501c3 status. Um, before that, we had worked under the umbrella of um, a, a nonprofit group called the Park People. And then um, today, actually in 2010, we have over 200 parks in the Houston-Harris County area, and we work with um, actually 11 school districts and um, have actually trademarked our name and, and have a um, licensing agreement that um, we are happy to use at, um, for areas other than this region where we are. So let's go to the next slide. Um, we work with the school and community. We work with the school district. Um, we also work with the county, um, of course, the city of Houston, and then we raise money from corporations and foundations. And just to go back to the first one, um, we actually give every school a goal of raising $5,000. And this is done in many different ways. Um, we engage the PTA or PTO, or maybe there's not one even, um, to come up with some fundraising ideas. It might be collecting pennies in a penny jar in the cafeteria. It might be taking pictures with the Easter Bunny or taking pictures with Santa Claus or, or whatever um, and selling those pictures um, to parents. It might be bringing in aluminum cans. It might be spaghetti suppers. It might be um, fiesta dinners. It, it can be a number of – it might be selling cookie dough. That's a big thing here. 
and um, <clears throat> almost every school in every neighborhood can raise $5,000 in a school year. We also ask that the school districts put in $5,000 for the park. And then, of course, um, they monitor construction, put the projects out for bids, and then um, maintain the parks after they are built because they actually are on the school grounds. We work with the county. Um, we are divided into four county precincts, and actually three of the four county commissioners have participated either in in-kind services or in funds from their park um, budgets. Um, for the use uh, to be put into Spark Parks. Um, one county commissioner who really helped at the beginning of the program um, actually used his road and bridge crew to help um, build tracks on some of the school grounds. And he also has a tree farm that he um, helped with providing trees um, for different campuses. The City of Houston actually um, provides us office space, and um, and then also we get federal funding. Um, some of you might know what CDBG funding is, Community Development Block Grant Funds, um, that come to the City of Houston. Also, Harris County gets those funds, um, and then there are other cities like the City of Pasadena that we have received those type of funds. And those funds can be used in low-income neighborhoods that are dictated by census data to have 51% or more of the community to be low to moderate income level. And the way that works is that we actually turn in the address of a school. They do a one-mile radius around the school. And then by whatever census data is available, which is almost always old data, they determine if there is 51% or more of the community that is low to moderate income level. We have gotten as much as $800,000 a year of this funding, and this current year we're um, getting probably about $500,000 from several different um, federal sources um, of this money that is dictated by um, low to moderate income level use. And then um, corporations and foundations, we're very fortunate here in Houston to have major corporations um, with home offices here, and then also um, um, very um, generous foundations um, in the Houston area that um, really do like the SPARC program because of the way it leverages funds. Um, from many different areas, and um, we, we really try to put an emphasis on the students' participation in the fundraising, the students' participation in um, the design of the park, and that, so that the students will then, and the community will have pride and take care of the park once it's built. Um, the process um, that we use is that a principal sends us a letter of interest, and we and it's not any kind of pre-form or anything that they fill out, but that they just send us a letter on school letterhead and tell us about the school and um, ask us um, for our help in, um, in incorporating um, park um, amenities on their playground. And um, we get those letters all year, and then we do a site visit in usually January or February, and we um, ask that the principal invite anybody that they want to be at that meeting. And we um, take pictures of the sites. We um, talk to PTA, PTO people. We, If they have business partners, um, whomever they would like to have in that meeting that they think would um, benefit the um, committee that would be um, joining together to not only fundraise but to design their park. And then our board meets in March to decide on what schools we're going to do um, that year. And usually we choose around 10 schools to do each year. And we always look at north, south, east, and west. 
um, areas of town. We look at city council member districts. We look at school board member districts. We look at um, county commissioner districts. And so we really um, try to each year have a representative group of schools from all over Houston. And then in May, we have a principal orientation meeting where we bring um, the schools that we have selected, um, those 10 principals, and, and then, again, anybody that they want to bring to a meeting and where we have a PowerPoint presentation that we show what we have done at other schools, give them some ideas, give them um, catalogs of different play equipment, um, and then empower them and charge them with forming a SPARC committee at their school. And these SPARC committees um, will not only raise funds, as I said, but then also work with a registered landscape architect or architect on the design of their park. And we feel that, um, or, or we encourage them to look with the help of a architect or landscape architect on their whole playground, what would their dream playground be? Maybe we can only do phase one of that dream, but um, go on and think about the land use of their whole playground. And as all of us know, you know, the areas of schools vary greatly. I mean, they might have lots of land to work with and they might not have very much at all. And so we work with all different sizes of campuses. And one of the things that we encourage is for um, the students to draw pictures of their dream parks. And I think um, Dave probably uses this also. Um, and what was interesting in one particular school, and this was back in 1991, and maybe some of you all remember when Jurassic Park was big, um, and this was actually before that, but a school um, had just studied a unit on dinosaurs. And um, so in these pictures of their dream park, um, dinosaurs would appear. And we were thinking, what in the world um, are we going to do to incorporate dinosaurs? Well, actually, we um, found a way to incorporate a dinosaur art piece in the park for the groundbreaking. We actually dug up dinosaur bones that had um, that we had placed <laughs> to be dug up. And then um, a student actually drew a um, picture of a dinosaur that became a T-shirt that said, Park Yourself at Travis. Travis was the name of the school. The dinosaur became the Travisaurus. And um, we actually planted bald cypress trees all around the park because, um, as all of the tree people know, um, that's a very old um, tree. So, and, and you're seeing actually the Travis Saurus on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, this is a design that we did that was interesting um, in that this was a um, plan to be a detention area at a brand new school, which is required now in the city of Houston to have um, some kind of mitigation for storm water. And so our new schools are required to put in some kind of um, area, detention area. And the school district was just going to put a, and, and actually did put just a rectangular area, and it was just going to be closed off to the school. Well, you can see that we turned that area into um, an environmental area with a butterfly garden in the um, bottom left-hand corner. Um, there's actually a cactus garden in the top right-hand corner. There are fruit trees. Um, there are um, a pond area. Um, we used area Eagle Scouts that needed projects to do the bridge, to build a tool shed, um, to actually um, do a crushed granite track around the area to plant trees. Um, you see a pavilion, outdoor classroom in the top right-hand side. And so um, we had some Eagle Scouts that built 
picnic tables and benches. And so this was a great project, um, bringing in all different kinds of people um, to work on this project. And let's see, um, the, as I mentioned, the school districts put the projects out for bid. And um, since we do use federal funds on a number of our projects, um, we are required to use David, Davis, Bacon, Davis Bacon wage rates. And um, so the construction is monitored um, and there's paperwork that, you know, goes along with the um, monitoring of the construction. And our construction usually takes around 90 to 120 days. And um, you can see in the top right-hand side some public art that has just been completed um, on some post um, columns that at the entry to a park. I like to think of tree planting as really the icing on the park. Um, after everything is built, then we come back with um, volunteers and different um, groups. We have a very active Trees for Houston group um, in, in Houston that um, we partner with. Um, they often will plant perimeter trees around the school that they then water with a watering truck um, for two years. And then um, we either use them or other groups to plant trees inside the park. And we usually um, plant 15 gallon container grown trees. Um, we're very lucky in Houston to have an environment where trees grow fast and um, we use native Texas trees that um, will take our hot summers and our long growing season. And and we also um, like to adhere to the growing season or the planting season that is best for our region, which is normally from um, October to the end of March. Um, it's very difficult to um, plant trees between April and September because um, of the heat of the summer. And then when everything is finished, um, we have um, a dedication. And um, we invite the different contributors, the different players for each park that have helped. And um, it's a big day. Um, we give certificates to the people that have helped with student artwork on the certificates, and it's a, a great celebration. And so the results are community involvement, community pride, a safe environment for um, the parents to send their children, and then healthy activities. We all know that childhood obesity is a big problem. Um, everywhere and so for us to provide place space outside whether it's a jogging trail um, or play equipment or outdoor classrooms where kids can learn outside or um, the activity of actually planting trees um, that is um, a great way to get kids outside and off the computer. And so, um, again, thank you for inviting me, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Great. Thanks, Kathleen. Carly, can you open the lines for questions, please? Yes. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, press star 1 and record your name clearly and loudly when prompted. It will be required to introduce your question. Once again, that's star 1, and it is star 2 to withdraw your request. One moment for the first question. All right. And again, uh, folks, feel free to type your question into the Q&A tab, and I can read it for you. Um, Kathleen, my ears perked up with uh, the mention of CDBG funds. Uh, I, I think working in a nonprofit, you know, this is similar for you, but you know, it's, it's one of the first concerns on the minds of everyone. Do you have any tips to offer people for uh, going after those funds in relation to uh, building well, trees? Every, everybody 
real, you know, has to realize that there is a lot of red tape that goes with those CDBG funds. But um, the way Spark actually got and got started getting them was that there was a newspaper article about the city of Houston having to return funds because they had not been spent and they had been allocated to park projects. And so we then went to the city of Houston and said, you know, can we fit in the parameters? Can Spark fit into the parameters of using those funds? And so um, the main thing, the main criteria is you spend them or you lose them. And so you need to really be um, organized so that you know um, that you can spend it if you get it. And can you provide more background to the federal grant money linked to census data? Well, um, they just do – there are census tracts um, that they can go in. I don't have the software to do it, but um, the Housing and Community Development Department has the census tracts, and they can go in and see what the incomes are of those areas, the average areas. Okay. Uh, and again, the, the magic number is 51%. If 51% of the community is um, what they determine low to moderate income level, then we can use those federal funds on those projects. Okay. Uh, one of the products that we offer to, uh, to members and folks who engage in Neighborhoods Month are kids' activity cards. Uh, and, you know, it's partially because some of the members had, had told us that you know, a lot of times they're dealing with bald and burlap trees or you know, heavy equipment, and it's kids, you know, kind of get in the way with those heavy things. And so that was one way that they, they had a tool to engage kids. Um, you seem to do such a great job with integrating kids into the work you do. Do you have any tips for, uh, you know, how you structure events and activities so that there's a place for kids? Well, um, kids can always carry mulch. <laughs> they can always water trees. In fact, um, oftentimes the care of the trees brings in competition among classes. If um, different trees are adopted by classes, um, I've seen where the trees are decorated by classes with little hanging things on the limbs or, or the rocks. Um, decorating the base of the tree so that everybody knows that Miss Smith's tree is this one and Miss Smith's class is very wants to make sure that their tree is living <laughs> and um, they bring they might bring in milk jugs um, so that the class then um, keeps a rain gauge and, and determines um, how much water in Houston we're blessed with having lots of rainfall but still if they monitor that rainfall and they see how many inches of rain a week um, that tree gets and then determine how much water that tree needs to be watered. Um, again, that's all a learning experience for those kids to research what native Texas trees are and the history of some of our trees, um, what trees they might have in the backyard. What is gr another great thing about having green space and um, things like trees and butterfly gardens and um, insects um, that come to an environmental area um, is all because um, so many of our kids um, live in apartments that might not have what we grew up with, uh, which was a backyard and and plenty of space to run and play. Um, some if, if if there are apartment complexes that feed into a school, the only green space those kids have is the park at the school. And so um, we we really um, want the kids to be very involved in the fundraising, the planning of the park, um, and then taking care of the park and using the park um, after it's built. Okay. Uh, I was talking with Ray Trethway at Sacramento Tree Foundation recently, and he mentioned that the Sacramento City Council recently passed the Children's Outdoor Bill of Rights. I guess this is something that uh, – is a national movement, and each city has adopted. And Ray had noted that there was, you know, it is certainly a lot of these issues overlapped with public health, but it didn't have anything specifically about planting a tree. I think actually it had something about playgrounds. And so he inserted a line, you know, and plant a tree was one of those uh, rights things. But 
Mm-hmm. I, I think the question that I have is, do you are you seeing any traction or any linkages that are, are happening on a concrete level in, in Houston area between uh, you know green infrastructure and play spaces with public health? Well, I think that there. I, I think Houston has been the fattest city in the country, <laughs> and so um, I think I just read in the, in the paper today that we might not be the fattest anymore. We maybe are the next to the fattest, and so anything in childhood obesity and diabetes is. We have a large Hispanic population in Houston, and um, it has been shown in reports that um, Hispanic children are very prone um, to be overweight and to get childhood obesity. So that's, um, and our Houston Independent School District now is majority Hispanic. And so all those are issues that a lot of different groups are trying to focus on, whether it is um, a group called Recipe for Success, where they are planting gardens on campuses and then bringing um, local chefs into those schools and actually preparing healthy meals with the use of the garden um, ingredients um, for the kids to take home and to show their families that they can eat something other than fast food. Um, all that is very important to have a running space. Um, we we do a number of tracks or jogging trails, um, and that's um, a very important piece, not only for the students but for older people that might live in the neighborhood to have a safe place to walk um, in the evening. So um, I think um, Michelle Obama's um, emphasis on healthy eating and um, obesity in children um, is a focus that we will all benefit from. Okay, Carly, do you have any questions in queue? I do not. Okay. Um, well, we will uh, wrap up our session then. We are just about at the top of the hour, so that will be perfect. So thank you, Kathleen, and thank you, Dave. So the presentations, the recorded session, and a resource list will be available in about one week. And we will email the, uh, the link to everyone who completes the survey that we're about to put up on the screen. Um, and please do, uh, or please fill out the survey anyway, even if you don't want to record a session. This does help us to uh, program our sessions better and know what, uh, what you're interested in. And Jared, I think I forgot to mention our website, which is www.sparkpark.org. Great. And we'll put uh, your website and Kaboom's website in the resource list. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next webcast session is Green Jobs, uh, Part 3 in our series. And this one's from incarceration or probation to employment. Uh, so on Green Jobs, it'll be Thursday, May 6th, same time, 1 o'clock Eastern. Uh, otherwise, I want to thank our presenters, Dave and Kathleen, all the participants today, and our sponsors, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service. Thanks, everyone. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time.